good day. So, our uh, topic for today is QoS and multimedia, that is quality of service and uh, multimedia. So, we will just look at these one by one. Hmm. Quality of service. Now, what is quality of service? QoS refers to traffic control mechanisms that seek to either differentiate performance based on application or network operator requirements or provide predictable or guaranteed performance to applications, sessions or traffic aggregates. Well, it uh, talks about a lot of things. The basic uh, uh, notion is this that there are some applications uh, which require one kind of quality of service. By the way, the quality of service uh, may mean so many different things, but the most important of them are the delay, network delay and the um, packet loss, all right. Delay and various ways the delay. Now, these two parameters and they may, it may uh, sort of come in various ways, they affect differently when you talk about different applications and uh, multimedia, by multimedia we mean uh, audio, video, etcetera. Uh, I mean put on the going through the net. So, that has got a different kind of QoS characteristics that has got a different set of requirements than let us say a file transfer. So, we will see how uh, we can get a handle on this QoS uh, and uh, how multimedia traffic is handled in the network. And sometimes it may so happen that some applications um, are more important than others. So, they need a, a better guarantee of performance. So, such things also come under quality of service. Just uh, take examples video and audio conference, they require bounded delay and loss rate. Okay. Uh, that means, the delay has to be bounded uh, and uh, also the variability of the delay should also be within bounds and the loss rate, loss rate of packets that should again be bounded. All right. uh, uh, as you can see that this is quite different from uh, let us say a file transfer where the losses, uh, uh, loss of some packets cannot be tolerated at all. So, it is somewhat tolerant of losses, uh, but more uh, sensitive about delays uh, and but, but uh, you know in a, um, when you are downloading a file you are usually not that sensitive to delays. Video and audio streaming. That means, maybe some from video server or some in some uh, internet uh, radio etcetera, audio or video is being streamed to different uh, clients. So, this again requires a bounded packet loss rate. Uh, delay, it may not be so sensitive to delay, uh, why we will see later. There may be some time critical applications like real time control. Here again bounded delay is important. Then there are some uh, uh, valuable or so called premium applications, uh, maybe the um, those who are run these premium applications, they are uh, ready to pay more for these and they expect better guaranteed service than let us say less premium uh, or less valuable applications. QoS requirements can be specified as delay, delay variation jitter, throughput that is what is the rate at which uh, you can send data uh, um, and error rate. <coughs> error rate means uh, some packets getting lost and uh, things like that. Now, there are two approaches to this stateless and stateful QoS solutions. Now, stateless solutions router maintain no fine grained state about traffic. This has got a, a, a positive point that this is very scalable. Uh, actually, uh, the kind of thing that we have talked about till now that routers do not maintain any states. Sorry. <coughs> so, the routers do not maintain any states. So, it is uh, simply the raw packet uh, forwarding uh, ca ca capacity that comes into the question. So, this is that way very scalable, this is also quite robust, but it has weak services because there is no guarantee about the kind of delay uh, or performance that a particular application will have to encounter. 
On the other hand, we have stateful solution, routers maintain per flow state. Now, so this flow is very important uh, while guaranteeing a quality of service. Suppose there is uh, some audio uh, conferencing going on between some people. Well, uh, the it may be the audio signal naturally is digitized and packetized and then these packets are flowing. This is a packet switch network essentially at the heart of it, it is a packet switch network. But at the same time, we not only talk about a single packet by an entity in itself, which is how we have dealt with packets so far, but the end users are interested in the flow. That means, the flow of packets. So, all these streams of packets that are flowing, uh, which contain this audio signal, uh, they constitute a flow and uh, the users are actually interested in the flow. Suppose, somebody wants some guarantee on this service, he wants a guarantee on the service of this flow. So, uh, merely looking at packets is not enough, but if that is not enough, you have to go from a purely stateless situation to a stateful situation. So, uh, and actually you have to uh, sort of uh, make out that this is a part of a particular flow. So, naturally if you are uh, if you are stateful, that means if you uh, go into the packet and look at what the kind of packet it is um, and maintain a state about it in the router, then you can give powerful services like guaranteed services <coughs> plus virtualization. Now, fine grain differentiation between different flows, you can give protection. problem that this is much less scalable. That means, when the number of flows through a router starts increasing and that is what will happen in any of the core routers, then the core router would not be able to handle this. So, it is much less scalable and much less uh, robust. robust. But, but we will look at both the systems, uh, both the approaches. And uh, the first one is a fully, I mean it is a stateful um, system and this is known as integrated services or int serve. So, this is an int serve architecture or ISA, it is an architecture for providing QoS guarantees in IP network for individual application sessions. So, we are talking about the entire session and the flow that has gone, uh, gone on during that session as uh, so a flow consisting of so many packets. It relies on resource reservation uh, and routers need to maintain state information of allocated resources, for example, G and respond to new call setup requests. Uh, so, the point is in, in, this, in this situation, uh, there I mean how will you guarantee that this particular flow which is starting will get the requisite kind of uh, guarantee of service. That means, its delay would be bounded, etcetera, etcetera. For this, you have to specially uh, reserve resources at uh, the intermediate points. Uh, I mean, resources like uh, buffer, resources like CPU time, and so on. So, if you are if you are doing so, you have to uh, reserve this resource for this particular flow, so long as this flow continues. That is uh, how you give uh, a better service to this particular flow than to other any ordinary packet. <coughs> So, it will uh, have to maintain uh, the state uh, uh, in, f in, the, in the form of these reservations and respond to new call setup requests. For example, it uh, as soon as you take out some resources naturally, it goes out of the available resource pool and uh, so if the new call setup request comes uh, for, the, for another session, uh, there some intermediate router may not be able to handle that. So, it will not be admitted. So, network decides whether to admit or deny a new call setup request. So, this is the basic idea of int serve. So, so uh, in this case, you, since you have to uh, reserve resources, there is a call setup phase, just like uh, so. This is almost like a virtual circuit which is being set up. So, there is a call setup request. Uh, which goes from uh, the source to the destination and back 
and on the way it reserves resources um, at each of the intermediate nodes. And if each of the intermediate nodes, that means each of the intermediate routers are ready to uh, provide these resources, uh, then the call will be admitted. For resource reservation, there is a particular protocol called uh, 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 this uh, reservation protocol or RSVP. So, this constitutes of call setup and signaling. Then there is a traffic QoS declaration and uh, per element uh, admission control. That means, whether the call could be admitted or not. Then there will be QoS sensitive scheduling. That means, uh, when a router uh, I mean first when a packet, a packet arrives, it may go into the buffer of a router and there may be various buffers. Now, uh, each of these packets will have to be scheduled for processing and then forwarding. Now, this processing may not be done uh, in an uniform manner, so it may be done in a QoS sensitive manner. Similarly, routing algorithm it may, may also be uh, QoS sensitive routing algorithm, QoS sensitive packet discard strategy. So, all these things come under uh, the in serve QoS component. So, we have uh, talked about uh, uh, scheduling uh, and some of the other things. So, we will talk now about RSVP. So, RSVP this is internet signaling, it creates and maintains distributed reservation state. This is decoupled from routing. Okay. One thing is, uh, is to use uh, routing uh, for setting up uh, paths, but then this has to reserve resources. Uh, so, this is this way this is decoupled from routing. It uses multiple trees set up by routing protocols, <coughs> not RSVP. So, multicast tree is set, uh, set up by routing protocols, RSVP is for uh, reserving protocols there, unlike ATM or telephony signaling, where the call uh, while doing the call setup you actually assign the virtual circuit. This is initiated by the receiver, this scales for a multicast and uh, it may use soft state. That means, reservation times out unless uh, refreshed. So, the you have to uh, I mean refresh your reservation from time to time and otherwise one particular flow may reserve and never use it. Uh, so, that part will go away. So, that is why it will have to uh, sort of go out of the, the reservation will ha have to time out. And latest paths discovered through path message forward di uh, direction and used by reservation messages in the reverse direction. Mm. So, this signaling semantics you have, have a setup, setup acknowledgement, setup response then you have admission control, tentative resource reservation and confirmation and this can be done in from in both directions simplex and duplex setup uh, and no multicast support. These are the signal signaling semantics in brief. So, let us look at the how uh, this goes. Suppose, this is the source, the source would uh, initialize initiate a setup. So, it will send a setup call to the uh, first uh, switch controller or router will go to the another one. Finally, let us say it reaches the destination. Each of the intermediate nodes send a setup act, so that the source knows that this is the way it is going to go, um, the, uh, the, the path is being set up. And then setup response will come uh, and an acknowledgement will go to the destination and another setup response and acknowledgement, setup response and acknowledgement. Uh, what we will have to see is that in this fashion after this uh, the resource has to be reserved at each of the nodes for whatever ser service that is being uh, asked for. So, session must first declare its QoS requirements and characterize the traffic it will send through the network. Okay. So, uh, there are two specifications R spec and T spec. The R spec defines the QoS being requested, quality of service that what kind of bound we want on the delay, what kind of bound we want on the jitter, what kind of packet loss is acceptable to me and depending on this uh, the resource is going to be reserved. Uh, that means, maybe a special queue or buffer will be set up just for this flow or, or, or maybe something will be done with scheduling, uh, there will be uh, some weight given to it for processor time and so on. 
uh, in the intermediate node. So, there is a and then there is a T spec that is traffic characteristic that uh, what kind of traffic, what is the bust, bustiness of the traffic, uh, etcetera, etcetera. So, this such traffic characteristic will also have to be sent. So, depending on the T spec and the R spec, the intermediate nodes will uh, uh, compute uh, what kind of resources this will require. So, a signaling protocol is needed to carry the R spec and T spec to the routers where reservation is required. RSVP is a leading candidate for such signaling protocol. So, far as call admission is concerned, routers will admit calls based on their R spec and T spec that whether they can handle or they can um, manage uh, to give uh, so much resources for this. And of course, there are financial side also that whether the whoever has initiated uh, whether he has an agreement to uh, I mean pay for such premium service and based on current resources allocated at the routers to other calls. So, if other call, uh, uh, senders have already reserved uh, full uh, I mean most of the resources in the intermediate routers then a new call may not be admitted. So, this is uh, her diagram you see we have the this is the router the request is specifies the traffic the T spec and the guarantees of service which is required which is the R spec. Now, uh, this reply to, to element considers unreserved resources and the res, uh, res required resources for this new request. If uh, it can handle that then it replies whether or not request can be satisfied. So, this achieves power flow bandwidth and delay guarantees. Example, suppose we want a guarantee uh, 1 Mbps and less than 100 millisecond delay to a flow. So, uh, suppose we have a network like this, first the uh, receiver uh, will uh, just uh, allocate resources that means perform power flow admission control. First of course, the path has to be set up that has not been shown and now this is the in the uh, return response uh, path. So, uh, perform power flow admission control. So, uh, install power flow state. So, for this state has the, this flow has to be recognized. So, for that the router has to have a uh, power flow state. Then challenge maintain power flow state in a consistent manner right up to the sender. If all the routers agree then only you can uh, give it. And then when sender starts sending first of all it has to be classified that this is indeed a part of this flow. So, per flow classification is necessary. Then depending on uh, how it has been classified it will be put in the appropriate buffer and the corresponding buffer has to be managed. So, per flow buffer management is also necessary and this way uh, it will uh, uh, go through all the routers per flow scheduling is necessary for CPU uh, resources and uh, the, uh, the um, flow will uh, go through. So, in the data path uh, we have power flow classification, power flow buffer management, power flow scheduling uh, whereas, in the control path install and maintain power flow state for data and control paths. So, that has to be done with buffer management. So, you see that for each of the flow the router has to do a lot of work. So, this does not scale unfortunately. So, this is very good at giving services, but if you are trying to maintain a per flow uh, kind of classification and management at each of the nodes, this would not scale because if the number of flows uh, goes beyond a certain level, then it would be very difficult to uh, maintain it. It would be very difficult to properly give it uh, buffers and queues etcetera in the intermediate node. So, that is why it does not scale so well. Now, stateless solutions are more scalable and they are more robust. Stateful solutions of course, as we have seen provide more powerful and flexible services. So, it gives guaranteed services plus high resource utilization. It can make fine grain differentiation between uh, different flows and it also gives you uh, protection on the way since you are uh, sort of demarcating each of the flows. Uh, this uh, I mean uh, Demarcating the flows is somewhat similar either to say setting up ATM virtual circuits when you do that you also reserve request, but that is done while setup uh, call setup itself. 
that is not done by a separate reservation protocol. Anyway, so it is similar to that or it may be similar to let us say MPLS, where a particular uh, flow is uh, can be um, differentiated from other flows and uh, it may be treated specially. Now, uh, then the point is on the one hand you have the raw internet is just takes a packet by itself and just tries to route it. If it cannot route it, it is the best effort, it goes off that means it is discarded. That is one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is that you have a full um, per flow classification and management for each of the flows, all right. So, where you can have a very good control, etcetera, but it does not scale. So, there is a question that can we do something in between, all right. And that is where the next model comes, which is known as a diff serve, differentiated service. So, here also this is also a stateful but <coughs> there here each flow, each distinct flow does not necessarily mean a distinct state, all right. So, these are sort of soft state which can include a number of uh, um, an, a number of which we can accommodate a number of flows together. So, that uh, the um, pressure on the routers in the intermediate nodes or in the backbone of the network becomes less. So, scalability maintaining states by routers in high speed networks is difficult due to the very large number of flows. So, diff serve provides reduced state services that is maintain state only for larger granular flows rather than end to end flows tries to achieve the best of both worlds. So, diff serve is intended to address the following difficulties with in serve and RSVP. Flexible service model in serve has only two classes one to provide more qualitative service classes want to provide relative service distinction like platinum, gold, silver, etcetera and simpler signaling than RSVP. Many applications and users may only want to specify a more qualitative notion of service rather than a quantitative notion uh, in the previous case. So, this is a diff serve model you have the have an ingress edge router and you have the interior routers uh, it goes to the egress edge router. So, edge routers traffic conditioning that means policing, marking, dropping etcetera they are done at the edge. The reason we want to do, do them at the edge of the network is that there the number of flows etcetera is much lower. So, you can handle it over there and when you come to the core the core routers are very busy. So, there we do not want to do that over there. So, set values in DS byte in IP header based on negotiated services and observed traffic. Interior routers traffic classification looking at this byte and forwarding um, near stateless code. Okay. This is almost like uh, let us say uh, MPLS or uh, ATM okay. use DS bytes as index into uh, the forwarding table. So, edge router it does per flow traffic management marks packets as in profile or out profile core router. <coughs> it does per class TM buffering and scheduling based on marking at edge. So, marking has been done at the edge preference is given to in profile packets that means in profile means that some traffic shape has been uh, sort of uh, uh, I mean has been negotiated or is expected and then something comes which is out of that shape that means somebody is sending uh, maybe more packets than are uh, more packets per unit time. Uh, than was uh, uh, negotiated. So, those are out of uh, profile uh, packets and assured forwarding. So, this is what the core router does. If you look at this, so marking and power flow classification etcetera is done at the edge, but in between uh, the uh, scheduling is done. The packet is marked with the type of service in IPv4 and traffic class in IPv6 renamed as DS. 6 bits used for differentiated service code point DSCP and determine the PHB or per hop behavior that the packet will receive. 2 bits are currently unused. So, um, <coughs> 6 bits for this uh, differentiated service code and this service code uh, will sort of dictate uh, how the it uh, this particular packet will be treated. For forwarding per hop behavior or PHB 
carried out in the interior routers. It simplified process based on class and resource specified when SLA was created. So, PHB has been uh, defined in a, a certain RS, RFP. For example, let us say you may I mean so it may have a this things for premium service it should have low, low loss, low delay, low jitter, assigned bandwidth is equivalent to point to point uh, leased line. So, that is the kind of service we want although this is not leased this is the uh, plain packet switch network guaranteed through policing and shaping in order to stay within the departure rate of uh, leaky bucket and WFQ. So, that is how it is uh, guaranteed and then since all the <coughs> intermediate nodes uh, guarantee that. So, it will get premium services. Traffic conditioning, it may be desirable to limit traffic injection rate of some class uh, users declares traffic profile e.g. rate and bus size traffic is metered and shaped uh, if non conforming. So, we have uh, seen this uh, already when we discussed uh, congestion control. So, uh, the packets are classified and then they are marked. Uh, now, when they are classified and marked naturally for the session some kind of T spec that is traffic uh, pass, uh, spec has been uh, ha was already negotiated. So, it meters to see whether it conforms or not and then the traffic may be shaped if by chance uh, uh, some burst comes and if uh, the system can handle it then it will maybe keep it for some time and then forward it uh, only at an appropriate rate, but if it goes too much uh, two way out then it drops it here itself. Now, we will uh, discuss how multimedia uh, I mean this QoS of course, is absolutely important for uh, especially for multimedia traffic as was explained. Uh, for ordinary data traffic like uh, web traffic or FTP uh, I mean file download etcetera, uh, those usually are not very sensitive to delay and of course, uh, variation in the delay that means, you may get a lot of packets in one bunch then packets may be slow in coming etcetera. Now, these things really do not uh, matter at least they do not matter much if it is within some bounds, but in multimedia these things are very important. For example, when we talk if the delay is beyond a certain level uh, then we feel very odd. Okay. For example, um, even a few years back if you had uh, called uh, made an international call which is routed in a very peculiar way you would find a lot of delay uh, when you are speaking let us say to somebody in USA. Okay, that is quite annoying. What is also I mean additionally what is annoying is that if the delay remains constant somehow people can uh, uh, manage it, but if the delay keeps varying a lot that is if there is a lot of jitter then that is very irritating for people all right. So, the multimedia stream has uh, on the other hand unlike data uh, let us say when we are talking maybe a few bits are dropped here and there it will not matter too much. Maybe I mean if you analyze it uh, using machines you will find some difference in quality, but as such in the human uh, to human perception most of the time it is it does not matter too much. So, the multimedia traffic is uh, <coughs> quite uh, different from let us say ordinary data traffic and as uh, network is uh, spreading and because of the way it is growing uh, people find it cheaper. Uh, and most convenient to use this internet or use this computer network for uh, this what was traditionally uh, a telecoms domain in the sense for uh, audio or video conferencing people are uh, using it. Uh, so, and also uh, the trouble is uh, that uh, many of the routers etcetera we have talked about in serve, diff serve, RSVP etcetera but many of the routers on the way are not going to support this all right because you need a consistent support throughout the path so uh, people still use the maybe uh, people still try to use the raw uh, internet uh, which is just handling it at the packet level not really taking note of the flows and still try to handle multimedia so how for that a set of protocols has evolved and we will just look at those protocols now. So, principles 
classify multimedia application, identify the network services uh, that the applications need, then making the best of best effort service. That means, you have a best effort service, so how can you make the best of it that we will see in RTP etcetera and mechanism for providing some QoS. So, these are specific protocols for best effort uh, and, and architectures for QoS. Uh, of course, if the network at the network level if you had supported QoS, uh, these uh, would have gone through much better. There are various classes of MM applications and not all are the same. There is streaming of stored audio and video that is one kind of application. For example, you uh, uh, download a song or a movie maybe. So, that is a streaming uh, <coughs> or stored audio and video is being streamed. Then there is streaming of live audio and video. Then of course, there are real time interactive audio and video. So, this, this way you can classify by multimedia application we mostly mean audio and video. Uh, so, this way they can be classified. So, fundamental characteristics as we have already mentioned that they are typically delay sensitive. Uh, so, they are sensitive to end to end delay, they are also sensitive to delay jitter which is the variation in delay. They are loss tolerant, so infrequent losses cause minor glitches. So, this is the antithesis of data which are loss intolerant, but delay tolerant. Then sometimes we like VCR like functionality when uh, suppose we are seeing a video. Uh, so, video we tend to sort of equate it with, uh, with the kind of functionality that we get in a VCR. So, client can pause, rewind, fast forward, push uh, slider bar etcetera etcetera. <coughs> and at the same time let us say when it starts um, a multimedia session may be an initial delay of may be 5 to 10 seconds is ok. Uh, 1 to 10 second until command effect that also seems to be ok. So, do we need a separate control protocol? Uh, we do uh, because uh, we uh, really have uh, no other way of getting any kind of control feedback etcetera on these streams as we will see. So, timing constraint for still to be transmitted data uh, in time for play out all right. So, we will uh, uh, look at this. Suppose, uh, uh, so we have let us say streaming of stored multimedia. Suppose, this is the recorded video which is uh, being uh, uh, sent all right. So, this is the recorded video, uh, this is the cu cumulative data that has been sent. Uh, so, this is like a staircase because we are, they are being sent as packets. Uh, so, chunks of data is going together. Uh, so, they are being sent and then uh, the um, first of all uh, you re record the video and the video is sent and in the third position the video is received and played at the client. So, this is streaming of stored multimedia. There is of course, a network delay between the uh, when the video is sent and when the video is received. So, as soon as you, you send it you cannot start seeing it immediately. So, streaming at this time client playing out clearly part of video while server still sending latter part of video. So, maybe he has a in this particular diagram uh, the um, I mean the client has already started seeing something although some of the data has still not been sent. Now, this is streaming of stored uh, multimedia is different from streaming of live multimedia. For example, say internet radio talk show that is a live multimedia, live sporting event which is being uh, webcast. Now, uh, streaming has a playback buffer. So, playback can lag tens of seconds after transmission, but it still has some timing constraint. Interactivity is limited. For example, obviously, if it is live you cannot fast forward it, but rewind and pause may be possible. All right, so, depends on how you are handling it. And so, this is unlike a stored uh, multimedia where uh, fast forward would also be possible. An interactive real time multimedia 
so this is uh, one of the most important ones applications like IP telephony, uh, video conference over the web, distributed interactive worlds etcetera. So, these are applications of interactive real time multimedia which of course, it has the uh, most stringent uh, QoS requirements. say end to end delay requirements, different applications have different kinds of requirements. For example, if it is audio, uh, if the end to end delay is less than 150 millisecond, it is good, okay. less than 400 milliseconds, maybe it is ok. Beyond that, uh, 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 people uh, seem to be bothered a lot. So, it includes application levels that is packetization and the application level delay and the network delay. So, higher delays are noticeable and they impair the interactivity. Session initialization, how does Kali advertise its IP address, port number, encoding algorithm etcetera, because while making a, I mean we have taken an example of an audio, let us say like an IP telephone call. So, all these issues are also there, so which we will discuss towards the end of this lecture. So, <coughs> If you are using a standard TCP or UDP IP, this is what we would have to do actually, but there are no guarantees on delay or loss, but multimedia application requires some QoS and level of performance to be effective. So, today's internet multimedia applications use application level techniques to mitigate as best as possible. So, this is what we mean by the best of best efforts. Uh, so, this is what we uh, that means we cannot do anything may be at the network layer etcetera, if we could may be implement uh, an in serve or diff serve it would be nice, but uh, in many mo many places most of the places that is uh, not practical at the moment. So, we do something we try to do something at the end points at the application level, so application level necessarily means the end points because intermediate so it will not go right up to the application layer. It will may be penetrate a little deeper, we will go into that. So, this is mostly done from end to end. Uh, so, this is uh, <coughs> whatever is uh, whatever is best is possible that is what we try to do. So, in this suit of protocols in this number of protocols first we look at real time protocols <coughs> RTP that is RFC 1889. RTP specifies a packet structure for packets carrying audio and video data. So, RTP packets provide payload type identification, what type of payload it is carrying, packet sequence numbering, time stamping, this time stamping is important for doing uh, giving some feedback that we will see when we uh, go to the next protocol RTCP. RTP runs in the end systems, RTP packets are encapsulated in UDP segments. Interoperability, if two internet phones applications run RTP then they may be able to work together and they, they may sort of uh, you may talk to each other uh, through the network. Now, RTP runs on top of UDP, uh, uh, this is once again uh, for obvious reasons we have seen both in TCP and UDP, UDP is a very lightweight protocol, so it is also expected to be much more efficient than TCP, TCP is a uh, heavyweight protocol, so it has a lot of overhead and all these acts of course, uh, keep on flowing. So, it uses UDP, so RTP libraries provide some kind of uh, 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 support over and about uh, the uh, transport layer uh, library. So, that is uh, that is where um, uh, that is how I RTP runs on UDP and uh, so that, uh, so this is a provide a transport layer interface that extend UDP. So, port numbers IP addresses are there in UDP itself and then uh, payload type identification, packet sequence numbering and time stamping. This is what RTP adds to UDP and then the application really is here. So, as I said that it moves a little bit into the application uh, domain may be uh, just to look at the RTP header uh, to give somewhat better service. RTP by itself does not provide any mechanism to ensure timely delivery of data or provide other quality of service guarantees, it cannot because that really depends on the what is happening on the way uh, and RTP is running just between the uh, uh, two end points. 
So, RTP encapsulation is only seen at the end systems, it is not seen by intermediate routers. So, routers providing best effort service do not make any special effort to ensure that RTP packets arrive at the destination in a timely manner, they, they would not do that. So, the services uh, in between is still uh, best effort. Uh, what can we do? Well, uh, since we look at it at the end points, so there we can affect some kind of control. Uh, uh, if you have uh, noted that this RTP protocol, this RTP header goes um, in front of the payload for, for the data. That means, as uh, let us say it is voice which is going. So, as the voice signal is digitized and packetized before each packet which is produced by the your application layer, the RTP header will come. So, it is really in the data. There is a separate control protocol called uh, real time control protocol or RTCP. Now, this is used in conjunction with RTP for multicast transmissions. Now, each participant in RTP session periodically transmits RTCP control packets to all the other participants. Now, each RTCP packet contains sender and or receiver reports. So, report statistics etcetera useful to application and this is what you might use to improve the performance of your uh, session, because nobody else uh, out there in the inside the network, inside the backbone, nobody really knows about your session. So, it is only the endpoints, but they exchange this kind of statistics through the RTCP packets and, and then, the, then the application can control uh, may be the rate at which uh, things are being done etcetera. So, some kind of feedback mechanism is present. So, statistics include number of packets sent, number of packets lost inter-arrival jitter etcetera. So, feedback can be used to control performance, sender may modify its transmission based on feedback. So, this is the main point that you get some kind of feedback, by the way this is running on UDP. So, there is no ACK packet coming on which you can send this statistic. So, they have to go. Uh, so, uh, what is done is that <coughs> this is uh, RTCP is actually in band control. So, a part of the bandwidth is kept for RTCP and through this bandwidth they uh, exchange this kind of information and the time stamp. So, you know that how much delay uh, is uh, uh, how much delay is uh, being experienced at the other end and after having uh, all these statistics you may do what you can at the application layer to modify the way you are transmitting to get better service. So, there are receiver reports. So, fraction of packets lost, last sequence number, average inter arrival jitter etcetera, they are a part of the receiver report. Sender report or SR, <coughs> so SSRC of the RTP stream, the current time, the number of packets sent and the number of bytes sent. Source description uh, SD, the email address of sender, sender's name, SSRC of associated RTP stream, etcetera. So, provide mapping between SSRC and the user or host name. Another uh, um, uh, use of RTCP is for synchronization. RTCP can synchronize different media streams within an RTP session. So, consider a video conferencing application for which each sender generates one RTP stream for video and one for audio. Now, the point is you have got two streams of packet, one for the video streams which will sort of go in <coughs> and then the audio has to be synchronized with it, all right. The sound is coming and the lips are moving in some other way and the sound is coming in some other way that will not do at all. So, they have to be synchronized. Now, in order to synchronize this RTCP uses the timestamp which I referred to earlier uh, and uh, tries to synchronize the two different streams. So, that is another important uh, use of RTCP. So, timestamps in the RTP packets tied to the video and audio sampling clocks, they are not tied to the wall clock time. By the way, wall clock times are also exchanged and this is to get an, ex, uh, get an idea about the delay. Each RTCP sender report packet contains for the most recently generated packet in the associated RTP stream, timestamp of the, of the RTP packet, 
wall clock time for when the packet was created. So, this gives you an idea about the delay. Receivers can use this association to synchronize the playout of audio and video. Then uh, bandwidth scaling, RTCP attempts to limit its traffic to 5 percent of the session bandwidth. Uh, remember that this is in band control, that means whatever bandwidth is given for the session, so within that only. So, whatever that RTP uh, <coughs> actual data packets uh, they are using, uh, may be 5 percent of that. RTCP tries to use and in this five in this five percent is uh, sort of divided maybe 25 percent for the sender, 75 percent for the receivers because there may be many receivers and this 75 percent will again in turn be uh, distributed amongst the um, receivers. So, suppose one sender sending video at a rate of 2 Mbps then RTCP attempts to limit its traffic that means RTCP traffic to 100 kbps. RTCP gives 75 percent of this rate to receivers remaining 25 percent to the sender. Now, we come to another protocol called RTSP, this is real time streaming protocol that means when it is I mean we have been talking about let us say interactive uh, audio or video conferencing that is interactive live, now we are talking about streaming. Now, user interactive control is provided for example, uh, the, pub, uh, the public protocol real time streaming protocol. So, it is a helper application displays content which is typically requested via a web browser uh, for example, a real player and typical functions are decompression if it is compressed audio or video, jitter removal uh, that means you play them back at a constant rate, error correction, uh, use redundant packets to be uh, used for a reconstruction of original stream, some kind of graphical user interface for user control like rewind, fast forward, etcetera. So, these are given by RTSP. What it does not do, it does not define how audio or video is uh, encapsulated for streaming over network. It does not restrict how stream media is transported whether it is TCP or UDP, it does not specify how the media player buffers audio video. So, these are uh, more at the application layer. So, this is a simple approach for internet uh, uh, I mean streaming uh, audio or video, audio or video is stored in file, files transferred as HTTP object received in entirety at client then passed to player. So, audio video are not stream, no pipelining, long delays until play out. So, here the problem is that if it is let us say some kind of a movie and if it is imported, uh, I mean if it is take, uh, downloaded as that entire file is downloaded. So, that uh, downloading that entire file will take a lot of time. Uh, this is of course, a very simple approach and then there is no problem, you went, uh, download the entire file then play it any way you like, do fast forward, reverse, any speed etcetera, etcetera. But streaming means as it starts uh, I mean the, um, the streaming the media uh, uh, as it starts streaming the audio or video file after some time after some delay it starts uh, the playback starts. So, I mean simple uh, situation is of course, you have a web browser, web server with audio files and uh, a um, uh, media player. Uh, so, that is uh, how you do it, nothing to see. So, HTTP request, so, uh, so browser gets a meta file, then the browser launches a player passing the meta file to the, uh, uh, to the um, uh, player and the player contacts the server. The meta file will contain all the necessary information, this is called progressive download. Now, let us look at streaming multimedia client buffering. So, suppose as before this is the uh, constant bitrate video that is being transmitted. Now, because of the network delay and the variability of the network delay, this is what the profile looks like of how it is received. But if you uh, do this after some sufficient delay and you buffer it, you see the main point is these two are never crossing, these two lines are never crossing. So, now you can play it at a constant rate. So, all this uh, delay variation etcetera that will um, sort of go and you would get a nice uh, streaming audio or video. So, this is the basic idea of streaming multimedia. So, 
this part the difference between these two this is the buffered part. So, client side buffering play out delay compensate for network added delay or delay jitter etcetera. Streaming multimedia where UDP is usually preferred we will also look at TCP how TCP is done. So, server sends at rate appropriate for client oblivious to network congestion. So, often send rate is equal to encoding rate is constant rate then there is a fill rate for constant rate minus packet loss. So, short play out delay 2 to 5 seconds compensate for the network delay jitter and uh, so naturally somebody does not really uh, I mean mind so much that if the playback starts after uh, let us say 5 seconds, but this 5 seconds the entire thing will be buffered and that will take care of the jitter and if error recovery if time permits. TCP it sends at maximum possible rate under TCP and fill rate fluctuates due to TCP congestion control because TCP congestion control the window size as we have seen can uh, keep on varying. So, larger play out delay smooth TCP uh, uh, delivery late. So, if you uh, start playing it after um, quite some time so that the you can handle this TCP uh, variation in rates etcetera then it is uh, you can get a smooth this thing. HTTP TCP passes more easily through uh, firewalls rather than UDP. So, um, RTSP example meta file is uh, created and communicated to the web browser, browser launches player as we have seen and player sets up an RTSP control connection data connection to streaming server. So, web browser gets an HTTP get and web server uh, presentation description, then the media player it set up uh, a connection with the media server and uh, it starts getting it buffers it and starts playing the media stream comes you may pause you may tear down etcetera. Finally, I will just mention about two protocols namely H323 which is an ITUT standard which is the old protocol for uh, setting up uh, telephone calls and I mean we will not go into the details of this actually details are H323 is aging a little bit and there is a newer protocol namely session initialization protocol. So, this again comes from uh, this thing. So, this is there is a all telephone calls and video conferencing calls takes place over the internet. So, that is the uh, vision. So, you can reach the colleague no matter where the colleague roams no matter what IP devices the colleague is currently using. So, there is this for uh, this thing for setting up call there is a large protocol. So, I can just mention it there are uh, this thing for setting up a call provides mechanism for caller to let callee know she wants to establish a call then provides mechanism. So, that caller and callee can agree on media type and encoding because that has to agree and provides a mechanism to end the call. Okay. So, uh, the first one is called an invite and then I mean there are all kinds of um, command for this. It also has uh, the facility to determine the current IP address of callee maps mnemonic identifier to current IP addresses. Um, there are other components of uh, SIP like uh, SIP registers and so on. So, we are not going into the details and then it has uh, some this thing for call management that means add new media streams during call change encoding during call invite others for a conference transfer and hold calls etcetera. <coughs> so, there are all kinds of details about codec negotiation etcetera and then you may reject a call also. Okay. So, uh, you see that uh, the this part about audio and video and multimedia over uh, the internet is uh, growing very strongly. Okay. At one point of time network performance was so poor that there was no question of accommodating this, but as the network performance has increased exponentially over the last uh, uh, so many years, now it has become possible to handle a lot of multimedia traffic uh, through the uh, network and this is becoming more and more popular and maybe um, in future the I mean of course, as I, I have forgot to mention one thing that we talked about in serve, we talked about diff serve, but the uh, actual strategy that people actually deploy that when you feel that it is not okay 
put in more bandwidth, throw more bandwidth at it, put another fiber, okay. uh, take up your multiplexer rate etcetera, uh, so that uh, you solve the problem, because the demand for multimedia is so great. Thank you. Good day. So, uh, today we will talk about network management. Uh, you know that as the network becomes very large, so we need support for managing this network. So, uh, we need support for keeping track of this network and uh, how that is done that is what we are going to discuss. So, our today's topic is network management. Uh, Network management is the process of controlling a complex data network to maximize its efficiency and productivity. The overall goal of network management is to help with the complexity of a data network and to ensure that data can go across it with maximum efficiency and transparency to the users. <coughs> the ISO that is the International Organization for Standards. Uh, uh, in network management forum divided network management into five functional areas, fault management, configuration management, security management, performance management and accounting management. Uh, out of this actually it is uh, um, uh, quite often you find that there are uh, two um, um, systems uh, which are deployed in a in in that case the trap will never come. Only thing is that when the network management station pulls that particular device, so he will fail to respond. So, that way he will find out that okay, something is wrong. So, there is so you should use a mixture of trap and polling to do your management. <coughs> So, then, so now let us quickly go through the types of SNMP packets. One is a GET request, retrieves the value of a variable or a set of variables and GET NEXT request, used to retrieve values of entries in a table. So, NEXT entry. GET BULK request, retrieves a large amount of data used instead of multiple GET request and GET NEXT uh, request. So, that in one go you can get a lot of information. So, um, bandwidth is conserved set request, set or store a value in a uh, variable uh, and response, response to get request or get next request contains values of uh, variables requested. Trap, send from agent to manager to report an event. Inform request, send from one manager to another remote manager to get a value of some value from agents under the control of the remote manager report designed to report some type of errors between managers not uh, very widely used. So, now we come to the uh, SNMP data types. Uh, 